Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rachel Wagot, Head of Regulatory Affairs at Innovate Finance, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar in partnership with KPMG on a user's guide to reg tech. So for those of you in the audience who are perhaps less familiar with Innovate Finance and our reg tech work, we are a not-for-profit trade association that represents fintechs and reg techs in the UK. And we launched our reg tech working group last year to champion reg techs and amplify the benefits with regulators, government, other policymakers, as well as buy side firms. So we've partnered with KPMG to produce a report to build awareness of the many leading reg tech solutions currently in the market and the impact they're having on the financial, um, financial services sector. So the session today will explore some of our key findings, including drivers for reg tech adoption and ingredients for a successful partnership between reg techs and financial institutions. I'm really delighted to be joined by senior leaders from KPMG and Money Hub, one of our reg tech members today. And before I hand over just very light housekeeping, um, the session is being recorded. We'll share the slide deck and the recording with you after the session. Um, you, can ha you can ask questions. There'll be a Q&A um, session at the end. Uh, in order to raise questions, you can just pop them in the chat box. So without further from me, I will hand over to Chris. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks everyone for joining. My name is Chris Steele and I'm a partner at KPMG. I lead our regulatory consulting practice, and so my day job primarily consists of leading regulatory change projects, many of which have a reg tech component to them. So an additional hat I wear is that I, along with, with James, also on the call today with us, lead our engagement with the reg tech community. And so just before we sort of dive into the main meat of the session, I wanted to do just build a little bit on what Rachel has just said by way of broader intro, and talk about what our aims are with this webinar and with the paper. So it's our vision at KPMG, along with Innovate Finance, to support UK RegTech. What we see is a fantastically innovative and a creative sector, and one with the potential to deliver huge benefits to the UK economy and to society at large. And in producing this report, which should be available very soon, once we complete some of the final steps, you know, what we aim to do is bring wider attention to what RegTech is, what it can be, and what it can offer. So our objectives are to first raise awareness of the many business critical use cases of RegTech, which now extend well beyond the more mature domains of fin crime and extends into existential and C-suite issues like ESG and consumer protection in areas like the FCA's new consumer duty. And to that end, uh, as you've already seen from the agenda there, we've got some great slots today coming up from Michael and from Vaughan on the success stories coming out of both of those areas. And the second objective we've got is to advance the discussion on how to navigate some of the very well publicized barriers to scale that RegTech faces. And my final point just before I hand over to James to kick, kick us off properly is that we hope that this webinar can be the first in a series and a series which will hopefully aid communication and cooperation across the whole range of stakeholders needed to move the dial on the RegTech scaling challenge. So that's our aims for today. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to James. Over to you. You'll meet James. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and good afternoon. I'll say it again. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thanks for making the time um, to talk about this really interesting and important topic. So um, I, I'm going to spend the next kind of 10 minutes just kind of talking through um, some of the big trends that we're seeing in the market, some of the some of the benefits and the drivers that we're seeing that can really help and aid um, adoption in this is, as I say, this really important reg tech area. So if we just go to the next slide, first of all, we just wanted to kind of set the scene. We go to the next slide. Perfect. No. Nope. Um, graphs. There you go. Perfect. Um, as you can see here, over the last three years, we've kind of seen investment in kind of fintech more broadly, but reg tech kind of peak um, in terms of volume in 2021. And we started to see that reduce um, through 2022. And this is kind of broadly in line with the technology sector. But one subsector that has been surprisingly resilient is RegTech. And actually, um, it's seen a similar trajectory on a deal basis as 
2021. So there's still an, an enormous amount of interest and actually money that's being spent and invested um, in this area. But why is that? So there's a few reasons. First of all, we are seeing a rapidly evolving regulatory regime and regimes around the world. And this is really driving interest. So across financial services broadly, areas like crypto, data, privacy, risk and ESG mean that, you know, we need to have um, solutions and different ways of working to allow us to adopt and adapt to these different regimes. And so we're seeing more of that. And we're seeing and we're forecasting actually more change in complexity occurring over the next 12 to 24 months. And what this does is it creates an immense challenge and a, and a huge amount of work for institutions to actually respond to this ongoing kind of regulatory burden. So how can we use new solutions and tools to allow us to respond to that? Um, the third one is around kind of changing ways of work. And so we're all living in a post COVID world and we know that you know, the world that we lived in before has changed quite dramatically. But surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, actually, companies are still grappling with how they comply with these risk and compliance measures that they have to have in place to allow for this hybrid way of working. And so how do we, how do we change these ways of working and what technology and solutions are out there to support us? And finally, another big kind of driver for this, in, you know, sustained investment is around an increased focus on AI and how can we have AI powered utilities really to enhance coverage and scale of, of this compliance kind of burden. And so areas like KYC, AML, identity proofing and others um, are still seeing dramatic investment and a lot of institutions around the world are continue to invest in this area. So that kind of gives you a bit of an idea of why we're seeing such continued interest um, in this area. So if we just pop to the next one, the next slide, please. Before we go into kind of the benefits and some of the other things, it's really important that we have a, a clear and a common definition of what we mean by this thing called red tech. Now, actually working with institutions around the world, it's amazing how many different jurisdictions around the world have a slightly different point of view in terms of what they classify as kind of reg tech and, and how they're investing in it then. So for the purposes of this discussion, we see reg tech as technology driven services to facilitate and streamline compliance with regulation. Now, this is an incredibly broad topic and that's why actually we have our reg tech taxonomy wheel. And this covers all the traditional stuff like tax, reg reporting and fin crime. But actually, you know, the broader areas and the, 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 the areas that are really hot in the market, and rightly so, because of all the things we've just talked about. So things in areas like cyber, data, which is a huge topic that everyone's grappling with, and really importantly, ESG, and incredibly topical. And we're going to talk, Michael's going to talk about that a little bit later. So whatever we do in financial services, we are always going to touch one or many of these different areas. And any flow of information or customer interaction that we have creates a need for us to explore how we can use RegTech or take advantage of RegTech to help us you know, manage this um, compliance burden that we have associated with these different um, themes within our RegTech wheel. So that kind of sets the scene a little bit and it helps us to then understand kind of the context of what we're doing. So what about the benefits? So if we pop to the next slide, in the past, when we've talked about this area, the RegTech area, um, and we put out our thought leadership and, and essentially our house view was we talked about the three C's. So the three, but this has evolved and we now have, we have a, a slightly different angle, which actually I think resonates um, really well within the boardroom, actually, when we're looking for investment in these areas. But let me just quickly talk through what I mean by this. So the, the traditional threes were, three Cs were around, first of all, cost reduction. So how do we use technology to streamline, automate, and optimize kind of end-to-end -end process, the compliance process potentially? So especially in areas where we have lots of structured and easily available information and data like thin crime, reg reporting, et cetera. And we've seen you know, a, lot of, a lot of growth in that area. The second one was around better compliance. So how do we use technology and reg tech to scale 
how we respond to that regulation and then monitor compliance to that regulation. So again, automating kind of controls and making sure that we've got kind of uh, more guardrails through the use of technology across all of our lines of defense. And then the third one that we always used to talk about was around working with complexity. So here we're making reference to things like tools and solutions that allow us to react and respond to market dynamics. So we have new ways of working that are enabled through the use of reg tech and technology to allow us to quickly put out new products and services. So we can, we can maintain that kind of momentum. But as I said before, once we've been doing the research and obviously we interact with, with organizations and institutions all over the world, one of the things or two of the things that have started to change is the different focus areas that we can take and the different lenses that we can take to reg tech. So the first one is around improved customer experience or CX. And you know, we don't always necessarily associate customer experience and regulation and reg tech. And so this is really how we are driving digital transformation. So how can we onboard a customer faster? How can we get to an answer faster for our customer? How can we make sure we're doing the right thing by our customer? So using the as a, reg tech as a real kind of catalyst for that change and driving customer value essentially. And then the third point, or sorry, the fifth point is around corporate experience. And so what we're saying here is, how do we improve our systems and data um, integration? And in doing so, we can enhance our um, internal um, user experiences because you know focusing on customer and customer experience is all well and good. But how can we make our, the people that we work with day to day how can we make their jobs easier? Because they also want to have the same great experience that our customers are now starting to have. So as you can see, there's going to be continued interest. Um, and I think there's going to be a, a ton more investment that's going to continue to be pushed into those different areas. And before I hand over to Chris, I've got one more slide. And this there's a, there's a lot going on here. And I'm only going to, these, these are kind of our, our big trends or predictions around um, what's shaping reg tech adoption in the future? And I'll just, I'll just um, pick on a handful of those. So the first one I wanted to pick on is risk and compliance is becoming much more front to back. And actually, the lines between technology and the business are becoming increasingly blurred. And really, the only way, and I've talked about our, the, the compliance burden, the only way that we can really keep on top of this is through the adoption of things like reg tech, different ways of working enabled with the use of technology. The next one I wanted to touch upon, which was in bold in the middle there, is around regulators becoming more digital. Now, this is a, a really important topic because this is what really then creates friction within the market. Now, we work with regulators all over the world, and we are seeing already those regulators going through the same digital transformation that we see you know, the financial services industry going through. So that's all well and good, and they're optimizing what they do, and they're becoming more digital in their operation. However, the important point here is they're starting to use these solutions, these reg tech solutions in how they surveil the market, how they interact with the market through digital means, but also when they're going out and they're doing reviews of institutions, they're using these technologies to be able to sample, well, actually, they just test the, a whole community of information and data. So again, it's a really important point because if institutions within those different jurisdictions can't respond to regulators' requests in a digital way, or they can't demonstrate that they're keeping up essentially with the regulator, they're gonna they're gonna potentially fall behind and it's gonna create, you know, potentially a challenge for them in the future. But how do they do that? Well, that's why I highlighted the next one. So this one is around the only way that we can really um, keep up with this pace of change, of course, we know that regulatory, the, the volume of regulation is going to get more and more complex, but the rate of change within technology is also incredibly fast. So we need more participation with the ecosystem, the reg tech ecosystem, because we've got a smart bunch of people who focus on very specific regulatory challenges, but using new and emerging technology. So. It's all about participation, the institutions working with those reg tech vendors within the ecosystem so that they can learn to potentially work with or use you know, 
create something internally through that education. But increasingly, the regulators themselves are also doing much more participation within the ecosystem. So again, learning from one another is going to be incredibly important. And then the last one before I hand over to Chris is around compliance management solutions, seeing a, a strong growth in 2023. And this is, in, this is especially important in the retail sector where banks need help to take the regulation, translate it into their environment, and then monitor and control it using technology to make sure that we're in compliance. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of momentum and kind of themes and trends that are, that are, that are essentially pushing the market more towards the use of, of RegTech. And, and we will see an increase in, in RegTech adoption in the future. So that's all I have. I'm going to hand over to Chris now, and he's going to start to take us through some of the challenges that we see in RegTech adoption. Over to you, Chris. Great stuff. Thanks very much, James. So despite the really strong set of drivers and trends supporting adoption that James has just outlined there, there are still quite a few challenges to navigate. Uh, many of those challenges have been around for quite a while. So we wanted to briefly touch here on either what is happening. So if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so we wanted to touch on this particular slide on what is either happening or really frankly, it still needs to happen to start to overcome and address some of those challenges. And those challenges fall on all participants, I should say all participants in the ecosystem, legislators, regulators, FS firms, reg techs, advisors and investors all, all obviously have their role to play. But on this slide here, we're focusing in on the actions that financial institutions could take to improve adoption levels. And just with a couple of call outs to hopefully stimulate some discussion in the Q&A later. Uh, first up, I'd go with legacy tech. Uh, so it's not a secret that many of the large banks and FS firms still have a huge dependency on outdated tech. And this has been a problem, you know, a really big problem for scaling reg tech. But with accelerated cloud adoption, the ability of the reg techs to connect via APIs, and some really exciting technology roadmaps out there amongst those large clients, I really feel increasingly positive about our ability as an industry to work around, I mean, what previously, frankly, felt like an intractable problem. Then if I, if I, I, I guess if I bring three and four on this slide together, put, it, put, put them both under the banner of understanding and desire to change, and engagement, to James's point around participation and, and engagement, yeah, I really feel that this could be one of the biggest things to move the needle. I think it's got the potential to move us from experimentation around the fringes, which I arguably we're already beyond that, but you know, if I characterise it as experimentation, and, and solutions which often struggle to scale uh, and struggle to integrate back into the mothership after the experimentation happens in whatever the innovation hub is at that particular institution, they struggle to integrate. We can move from that to genuine innovation, which can really unlock some of those fantastic benefits that James has just outlined a moment ago. That's really where we want to move to. But many of you on this call know that a lot better than I do. You know, many of you are in the vanguard. You know, you're the organizations looking to work with the reg tech vendors. So it would be really great to hear from you. Please do post some questions in the chat. Uh, perhaps you give some thoughts on what you think needs to change within your own organization, anonymously. Uh, or perhaps you can talk about uh, what, what you think the vendors need to do to help you, what those reg tech solution vendors need to do to help. So if I move on from the perspective of the FS institutions, thank you very much. This, this final slide, before we dive into the two use cases, covers some of the routes potential routes to navigating the challenges that we've outlined in, in the paper, which hopefully you'll see very soon. First up, I think James has, has touched on this already. The role of the regulator clearly has a really big role to play. And I, I, we've been lucky, we are lucky here in the UK with the FCA and the Bank of England and what they've done so far. Maybe, maybe not all of you will agree with that broader statement around uh, the regulator's role, but certainly in this sector, in this segment, They've been very open. They've been very engaging with our industry. Um, but th th there's always more to do. Uh, and we, uh, there are a couple of, I think, enhancements which could make a real difference. First, the sort of setting out of the regulatory expectations for fully embedding and utilizing technology. 
you know, we've talked, you know, many papers talk about tech neutrality, but I think there's, there's a piece there around, there's an expectation around utilizing the latest and the most robust and resilient technology with the, the, the interrelation between tech and the, the opera's agenda, obviously. A second enhancement, I think, is, is an acceleration. Again, as James has touched on just a moment ago, that acceleration of the program to digitize the regulatory framework, that could make a huge difference to the reg techs and a huge difference to how FS institutions can utilize these technologies. Another one I should uh, highlight would be clearly there's a, there's a big piece on data standards and interoperability. I won't dwell too much on this because Vaughan is going to talk about his experience with PSD2, open banking and open finance and has got yeah, has a really excellent live case study there to really get into the nuts and bolts of what, what has worked, what can work and what's worked perhaps not so well around that area. Then the final one I would highlight before handing over to Michael is, is, is one for the regtex themselves. It's, it's incumbent upon the regtex to demonstrate that they're well controlled, well capitalized and resilient. Because this is a, a refrain I heard in the early days from my, my clients around working with the regtex. And I think we've made great strides there. But there is a piece around maturity, but there is a piece around this engagement with governance and control and that side of things, which can, I think, help with some of these adoption challenges. But frankly speaking, you know, everything on this slide and everything I've said will be for naught in the event of a five degree C warmed world uh, where we may be living on small islands. Um, so we're going to hear now a little bit about how RegTech can help with sustainable finance and impact investing. Uh, and Michael's going to tell us about some of the data and tech solutions uh, that can make and create and support change in this crucial area. So Michael, over to you. Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Michael Johnson. Um, I lead on ESG regulation in our, our wealth and asset management consulting practice. Um, and over the next sort of five or 10 minutes, um, I'm gonna try and give a, a whistle stop tour of uh, the, the different areas where we're seeing lots of opportunities for the use of reg tech in the sustainable investing and, and ESG space. So I've got um, kind of four headline areas that I want to, want to touch on. First of all, um, ESG data. So um, the, the quality, consistency and, and coverage of ESG data is probably the, the biggest challenge that our clients face when they're trying to integrate ESG into their investment process and in the second line, oversee uh, the, 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 the sustainable products that, 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 their, that, that their firms are running. Um, but there's very limited coverage across some asset classes. Lots of the ESG data that we do have is self-reported. And very often, um, uh, different data vendors and different providers of ESG ratings will come to very different conclusions on the same companies. So there's a consistency issue. And of course, a, a lot of um, a lot of the ESG data that we do have is is qualitative in nature as well. So the, we're really seeing two types of uh, solutions here in the reg tech world to, to deal with those issues. Um, first type of solution is all about the the quantification of some of those harder to quantify ESG risks and opportunities so that they can be systematically integrated into investment processes. Um, so for example, um, at KPMG, we have a, we have a tool, um, Climate IQ, which tries to do this on climate. And really that's all about uh, quantifying the financial impact on investee companies and investment portfolios of different climate scenarios. So a, a 1.5 degree, a two degree, a, a hot house world. So that's one example of, of, of that type of solution. Um, the second type of solution that we're seeing um, particularly to address the the, uh, the consistency of data issue and the, the divergence of, of views that different uh, ESG ratings providers have is um, a move to implement big data analytics platforms that, that are capable of sucking in uh, ESG data from multiple different sources and providing helpful analytics and data visualizations to support investment decisions um, and um, 
provides a view on the ESG characteristics of investing companies and portfolios that um, utilizes multiple data points rather than just relying on one, one data vendor. And we're seeing those types of solutions being used both in the in the first line to, to inform investment decision making, but also uh, in the second line investment risk functions too, particularly in the context of uh, investment products that are badged as ESG or sustainable, where there's where there's uh, the potential for greenwashing to take place. So that's that's data. Um, next up, uh, reporting and disclosure. So. Um, Mandatory ESG disclosures are on the rise globally. We're seeing lots of regulators implementing those requirements for uh, ESG disclosures at both a corporate and a product level. And it's it's that product level reporting that uh, is proving a real challenge for, for, for lots of our clients. So uh, we're helping lots of clients at the moment with uh, SFDR and TCFD. Um, both of which have product level reporting requirements. And uh, some of our clients, uh, they are going to be required to produce several hundred product level reports every year, um, setting out the ESG characteristics of their products. It's a, it's a real burden. Um, so pretty much all of our clients are looking to uh, automate that report production process. Um, and we have a partnership with Workiva that, that seeks to do just that. So sucking in qualitative and quantitative data from different sources and using that to populate standardized uh, disclosures that can be rolled out across the entire product suite to, to make that reporting burden a, a bit less painful. There's also an opportunity here uh, in the private market space too, where yeah, uh, uh, unlike in unlike in public markets, you can't just uh, buy a data feed that gives you everything you need in terms of uh, ESG data on your the assets that you hold in your your portfolios. You you kind of need to go out and get the data yourself directly from the management teams at your portfolio companies, the management companies that are running your buildings, or the the operating companies that are running your wind farms, depending on what what asset class we're talking about. And fr frankly, this is an area where we see um, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of uh, manual reporting processes. And given the increasing prominence of, of ESG and the increasing reporting burden that, that firms in the private assets world are facing, pretty much everybody recognizes that that's not a long-term solution. So we're seeing lots of interest in uh, data collection and reporting platforms for private markets private assets. So that, that's that's the, the reporting and disclosure piece. Next up, uh, stewardship and active ownership. Um, so, so this is a this is um, investment managers, asset managers using their influence as shareholders to uh, uh, interact with and engage with and uh, influence that their investee company is using either interactions with management or using their using their voting power. And stewardship is um, really increasing in focus at the moment, partly driven by uh, partly driven by regulation, but also driven by the climate transition and uh, the need to the need to align portfolios with with net zero, pretty much all the firms that we're working with see engagement and using their the, the power as shareholders as the, the key lever to transition their, their portfolios to, to net zero, um, as opposed to, say, divestment, uh, at least in the first instance. But um, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, the tooling and technology that we've seen um, in the context of, of engagement and stewardship uh, is, is fairly antiquated. So a lot of the systems that we see being used to track, monitor, report on, and provide analytics around around stewardship are, are very uh, have very basic functionality and really don't provide provide um, provide useful analytics that can help improve the way that asset managers go about uh, engaging with their investee companies. 
So um, we're seeing uh, we're seeing lots of firms actually invest in upgrading those systems to provide better analytics and to provide better reporting capabilities, particularly as investors and clients are, are, are increasingly interested in the the types of the types of uh, engagement activity that in, that their that their managers are are undertaking. And I suppose that the, the second um, the, the second uh, interesting bit of technology that we're seeing here is. Uh, technology being used to democratize proxy voting and engagement by bringing end investors closer to, to, to that process. Um, so we've seen some examples of technology being used to canvas the opinion of investors on particular engagement topics or particular resolutions that are going forward to, to company AGMs. And the, the, the feedback from that being used to inform the asset manager's own approach or the way that it will vote, particularly on high profile, significant um, resolutions. But we're also seeing some managers directly give power to, to end investors to, to decide how they should vote on. So that's, um, that, that's going to be a really interesting space over the next few years. And we expect a lot more activity to, to, to happen here. And then the, the, the last point that I wanted to talk about was uh, was, was regulatory change. So um, strictly speaking, this this isn't a, a purely ESG or sustainable investment topic, but I think uh, ESG regulation, the, the regulation of sustainable investment is um, a really good example of the challenges that firms are facing around uh, reg change. And some of the ways that some of the ways that reg tech can be used to, to help solve those challenges, and that, that's for two reasons really. So the first is um, around volume. Uh, pretty much every major financial services regulatory center is bringing forward regulation on sustainable investment in ESG, um, and indeed at KPMG, we are our regulatory insights center produces a, a regulatory barometer that's designed to. Um, uh, provide a view on where the real pressure points are going to be over the next few years when it comes to reg change and ESG regulation and sustainable investment is by far and away in the lead and uh, pretty much all of our clients uh, are struggling with the volume of regulatory change. And the second, the second reason is complexity, particularly cross-border complexity. So we're seeing uh, different financial services centres take very different approaches to um, to the regulation of, of ESG and sustainable investment. And, and to deal with this, we're seeing some really interesting uh, pieces of technology being developed to um, automate the horizon scanning process, linking, uh, linking, it to, linking it to a firm's regulatory footprint. Um, and we're even seeing some, uh, s s some interesting pieces of, of work going on to to automate the business impact assessment process. So linking your horizon scanning capabilities to uh, your policy and control framework and being able to get a view as soon as a new policy paper or consultation paper is published. Okay, how does this hit my firm? Where does it, where, where, where is it gonna impact? Where is it gonna impact the business? And we, we expect this to become, this type, of, uh, this type of tool to become a lot more powerful as uh, regulators increasingly become more digitally savvy and technologically savvy themselves. So uh, putting out policy materials, putting out guidance, putting out rules in a more digitized format in a way that can be easily ingested and passed by, by, uh, by these types of tools um, in exactly the way that, that James and Chris spoke about, about earlier. So um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, hopefully that gives everybody a, a good flavor of um, the, the different opportunities we're seeing across the, 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 the sustainable investment uh, world to, to, to use to use reg tech. And um, with that, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Vaughan from Money Hub. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you to uh, Innovate Finance and KPMG uh, for the opportunity to uh, come and be your case study for the day. Um, for those that, that don't know Money Hub, I think we will uh, uh, be an interesting uh, background because back in 2014-15 when we were 
winning Finnovate uh, Europe, we would very much have been seen as a personal financial management uh, tool. And over time, we've really evolved into identifying as uh, an open data platform. Uh, and as increasingly, uh, we've uh, been looking to support decision uh, services, uh, provide predictive analytics and also compliance reporting, then uh, we've evolved really. Uh, we've moved with that drift that we were talking about earlier in the presentations towards uh, being uh, in very much involved in regulatory technology as a result. If we could uh, skip forward a, a couple of slides, uh, and again, thanks. Yeah, and one more. Um, so I've um, really chosen to uh, look through the lens of uh, consumer duty regulation today in particular, because I think it actually encapsulates a lot of the elements that James is talking about and, uh, and Chris in terms of the opportunities and challenges that we've faced as an organization uh, and also the challenges that uh, this um, new set of uh, regulations sets for firms. Um, I was just going to give a little bit of context to consumer duty. I know some of the audience will know it very well. Uh, for others, particularly those overseas, may be less familiar uh, with what it's about. Um, it is a very data intensive set of regulations in order to comply with it, which is what I'll come on to and then show you a little bit around how open finance uh, can help and some of the use cases that we've been developing. So if we move into the next slide, thank you. So there's a direction of travel here. Um, you can go back a long way to the uh, culmination, really, of consumer duty, which is all around uh, improving customer centricity and the outcomes for uh, consumers. Uh, but it's been intertwined, really, over a number of years with developments in um, enabling consumers to leverage their own data for their own benefit. And this was particularly uh, seen, obviously, in GDPR and the Data Protection Act in the UK, which established the principles of consumers being able to access their own data, uh, for that data then to be portable and in a machine-readable format. And how firms comply with that, whether that was through APIs or portals, was really down to them. But it's, uh, it's an area which is still evolving. It was, um, again, entwined with the open banking regulations uh, coming in. And now we're seeing other developments like pensions dashboards coming together, uh, changes in cookie laws or GDPR2, as some uh, refer to it, and ultimately the open data and smart data initiatives, which are not only in the UK, but around the world. So we've seen this twin track of um, regulation around uh, outcomes and access to data uh, is really being uh, closely coupled over time. Next slide, thanks. Um, so quite a busy slide, but um, for, again, just the summary purposes, um, the the rules really uh, for consumer duty uh, set this principle around focus on, on outcomes. It covers retail consumers across the entire waterfront of financial services. Um, those outcomes, particularly around governance, uh, price, value, customer understanding, and consumer support, including uh, services and processes. Um, so it does, in many ways, sort of cut across all of those regulatory areas, the five pillars that Chris was, was talking about um, around customer experience um, through to dealing with uh, complexity in organizations to deliver outcomes. And from our point of view, um, our technology is aimed at both monitoring customer outcomes through assessments and tests, but also helping firms better understand, and importantly, um, evidence uh, the outcomes that those consumers are achieving. So consumer duty really has um, crystallized, if you like, a lot of our development over time from a uh, financial well-being solution for uh, consumers and employees 
to um, now actually being a key element for enterprises that are seeking to comply with these regulations. So let me show you a little bit how that happens on the next slide. Because of the nature of the consumer duty uh, rules, it does actually impact across uh, an entire spectrum, really, uh, of a product and, and customer life cycle, um, from how products are designed and perhaps moving from broad brush personas and segmentation methods to uh, more targeted, precise um, market of one type analysis. Um, through prospecting, uh, understanding the full context of a customer, through the onboarding stage and into ongoing uh, suitability as uh, both economic conditions or individual circumstances might change. And then ultimately um, to help people um, around uh, exiting or making comparisons and migrating to other uh, more suitable uh, products. And uh, KPMG uh, clearly have been very active in this, helping firms put their high-level plans together. Um, and now uh, firms are looking forward, no doubt, to inspection visits around that ahead of implementation next summer and the following year for the, uh, the back books of business. But it is a pervasive uh, set of regulations. So um, if we move on, thanks. We did some surveying recently around the readiness uh, of organizations for these uh, regulations. Um, it was a very patchy uh, awareness and readiness and indeed confidence in being ready in time. But it was clear that a lot of organizations were waking up to the fact that they would need to invest significantly in customer data and insight technology. Um, with um, nearly a quarter estimating they would be spending at least five million in order to uh, make the most of the opportunity. Um, move on. Um, so what are those outcomes? I mean, for us, I think as a firm, we've always felt really that a good customer outcome is actually a combination of a number of factors. It's the quality of the product and the service that's provided, the emotional appeal of the, of the brand that the um, individual's um, buying from and the trust factor and how that evolves over time. But it can all be undermined uh, or indeed multiplied by the data insights that an organization has got. And historically, of course, they have been somewhat dogged by siloed product-based legacy systems. Um, but our belief and our activity is around making open data uh, the route to fulfill consumer duty. So if we move on again, thanks. Um, as an organization, we've got a lot of uh, features uh, which talk to the cross-cutting rules and the customer outcomes. Um, it uh, ultimately helps organizations not only to meet some of those um, key uh, illities, as we call them, around the suitability, the vulnerability, affordability, and so on, but also ultimately enables firms to build a consumer uh, consent-based data lake, which uh, we think is going to be not only the essence of uh, regulatory compliance, but actually of competitive advantage for firms uh, going forward, uh, particularly when cookie laws come in and uh, the way that uh, you relate and acquire on board uh, customers will again increasingly, we think, be only through uh, consent-based um, relationships and customer engagement. So that's the sweep of what, what we provide um, and, and how we provide it, if we just move on, is that we have a wide set of um, individual components and uh, we have uh, sets of APIs which we deliver to firms which cover all the really different elements of an individual's uh, financial life um, from their position on income and expenditure, their assets, their liabilities, 
we go well beyond um, open banking. We have um, connections into investments, pensions, mortgages and loans. So, so we, we deliver a, a genuinely holistic picture of the consumer, both back to themselves and by consent that that can then be shared with the, uh, the, the financial institution, the financial services uh, provider. All of that can be uh, mixed uh, into different propositions. And if we just move on, and those can then form part of how um, consumer duty can be um, delivered in, in practice. And I particularly point to the fact that all of this can then be supported from the enterprise side by um, dashboards around suitability um, is particularly key at the moment, something familiar to firms that are MIFID II uh, regulated already, uh, and particularly affordability uh, at the moment is a hot topic. We can synthesize all of the uh, data by consent to play that back, to look at outcomes that individuals are experiencing, and, uh, and then feed that into the reporting that firms are have, going to have to do back to their FCA supervisors who will be quizzing them around what evidence do you have that you are delivering good customer outcomes. So um, just move on again. This is um, a, a slightly scary picture, really, of one of those dashboards. Um, this is how we're sort of looking, for example, in the, in the lending sector. The kind of data that we pull together can be enhanced by credit reference agencies, certainly supplement it. Um, but you can see the sorts of um, data and intelligence that we're getting around the context of an individual, which can actually sometimes, for example, you know, turn a yes, no decision on uh, a mortgage in this particular case into uh, a not now, but here are other things that you could do to actually qualify and become uh, eligible for a mortgage late, later on. So this is just one of the four key dashboards which we operate uh, for firms um, as part of a reg tech uh, solution. Um, so just coming to a conclusion, just moving on. The overarching uh, trend has been away from uh, product push by organizations and those silo data centers that people have got towards a much more personalized customer uh, experience. Uh, that's what we've been delivering and consumer duty, if you like, is very much aligned to what, what we believe. Um, and I think if we just go to the final slide and in our view, I think we share very much with, with KPMG that an improved customer experience um, can actually be very much uh, married to reducing cost, uh, creating a, uh, a dividend really around better compliance, um, certainly uh, solving uh, the complexities, uh, particularly around data, and also uh, deliver a good uh, corporate experience, both from a customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and, uh, and also ultimately an efficiency point of view for an organization. So uh, we, we're certainly of a view that uh, regulation is not is not the enemy of, uh, of these improvements. And uh, the platform that we provide is very much aimed at uh, the win win for the industry and the consumer. Hopefully that leaves us some time uh, for questions. I'll hand back to Chris, I believe. Thanks very much, Vaughan. That's uh, yeah, some some fascinating insights there from Michael and from Vaughan. Very very interesting stuff. So yes, we have got some some questions coming through in in the chat. So I will try to deal some of those out. So James, if I could come to you first with a question from the audience. Uh, the question is, what are the one or two top priorities that large financial institutions are grappling with right now? In what areas of reg tech do you see budgets? being allocated or increased? So really great question. Um, and if we keep it in the context of RegTech, obviously, because that could be a really big, long-winded answer. Um, 
I see I see a couple of, of key trends and you know me and, and and others within KPMG have been working with institutions around the world and indeed the regulators around the world and we've done a, a series of studies actually that help us kind of hone in on where are those big areas of spend so in terms of kind of the two kind of really large priorities um, I would say the first one actually I would say data and data but data is definitely one um, but data coupled with kind of legacy systems and environments. And we've we've talked about that already, but but really how do you get these these systems to talk to each other? But really the 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 trigger there and and you know, I think a lot of what Vaughan talked about as well is around information and data and having that right data in the right format in the right place that we can do stuff with. The second one I think is is actually around people and culture. So and this is really around the willingness of people to explore how they can use kind of new ways of working and enabled by technology in their environment. So if I if I talk to and I do talk to lots of banks, again, kind of locally, but also internationally, everyone's terrified of, you know, failure. Everyone's terrified of actually changing up what they do. And this isn't necessarily a new story. However, I do think that there's much more emphasis now on how can we change that people? How can we change that culture to make sure that people can identify potential areas where they can use these new technologies? And then going to the second part of the question in terms of kind of uh, the, the budgets being allocated. Um, if I go back to our kind of regulatory taxonomy themes, I would say there's a continued, you know, the front runner is always around kind of fin crime and those areas, as I say, kind of well-trodden areas that have structured data that can be that can be easily used. But I think increasingly emerging areas around conduct and surveillance, around taking unstructured data and looking at customer interactions um, and then overlaying a compliance kind of lens. I think there's there's an enormous amount of focus on that, and that's kind of up and coming. And, you know, the other one that, um, Ma that Michael touched upon as well, I think, is around kind of linking risk and compliance and actually um, kind of the convergence of, of a lot of that. So you take the risk and then you understand how it's mitigated by a control. Is it in policy? So there's a, there's a lot more of that kind of coming together of uh, multiple functions through the application of technology as well. So hopefully that gives a, a, a relatively uh, targeted answer. Great stuff. Thanks, James. I think we could talk about that one for, for a long, long time. So great question. And I hope that's uh, answered or at least gone towards answering the last that question. Uh, we've got another one that's come through. Uh, Vaughan, I might, I might put this one to you. What is the single biggest thing you think needs to change to increase adoption of RegTech? Um, well, um, clearly, uh interoperability of standards and uh, and the protocols around that uh, would be an enormous enormous help legislation clearly underpinned um, open banking uh, in terms of um, helping to um, make make that easy um, but I think one of the important things apart from the technological underpinning and the legislation um, that, um, that 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 will help um, I think it's around getting the value exchange right between the individual consumer and the financial uh, services firm such that um, there's a position of, of trust, if you like, between if, if you will share data with us, then we'll make sure that um, we give you a, a better service and more appropriate uh, and relevant solution as, as a result. And I think that's one of the one of the key things. Um, and firms can certainly also play on the convenience factor. Um, you can see how you can collapse time in uh, in processes for individuals using this this kind of technology. And I think that's why you see the the numbers using open banking, you know, have accelerated over time. And it's because individuals ultimately and small businesses are getting something out of it for themselves. And that that's got to be the key thing: is that firms have got to think that. You know, it's not about exploiting data, it's about um, sharing for mutual benefit. So I think that's one of the key mindset and cultural uh, shifts that, that's got to happen too. Yes, that's that's great. Well, yeah, I, I would, I'd also highlight some of those cultural points uh, as well. 
James, anything you'd add to that before we yeah, move so, on? One more question so after this. One of the one of the so I've been working with a few institutions um, around and looking at reg tech adoption. Um, and I, I guess the first thing I would say is it's not just about technology, as Vaughan rightly said. It's, it's a much broader thing. It's about investment. It's about tone at the top and all of those sorts of things. But, you know, if you break it down and you talk to the heads of different compliance or risk functions or business units, um, they will point to until the regulator gets behind it and doesn't necessarily give it a stamp, but says you need to start looking at this more. I think that that is the impetus that a lot of the institutions around the world are actually looking towards. And I think the point we made earlier in the presentations around the application of reg tech within the regulators and this whole concept of supervisory tech or soup tech and how they're starting to use these these technologies to surveil will be a huge, will, will create a huge amount of friction, as I said before, to then drive this adoption. So I think they're already starting to get behind it more. Um, and if you look around the world, you're seeing much more guidance come out from the regulators on this. And this is going to actually really push, I think, adoption in the future. Great. Thanks very much, James. I, we've got three minutes left. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll risk one. Um, we'll have to make it quick, though, to make sure we respect people's diaries. Um, and James, perhaps I'll come back to you for this one as well, because I think it's in your wheelhouse. If human beings are at the core of risk challenges, how can you automate what they do? So that's a really interesting one. So um, a lot has been said and spoken about in various you know, press articles and things around automation, right? And, um, but there's always, we always need a degree of human interaction and you're absolutely right. And it's in people's heads. Um, what we need to do is really understand kind of the inputs and outputs better. So this is all, again, I'll go back to what Vaughan talked about around data. We need to make sure that we really understand how all of this information, all of this data interacts and then what's applied. And that's the way we start to digitize. So we're not taking work away from the human beings. We still need to, we still need their judgment and their expertise, but there's an awful lot of, of things that they do around going from one system to another and getting these different data points, getting that collectively together, I think will, will help to assist in how we slowly um, reduce the level of reliance in a, in a positive way um, of, of human beings to use the words in, in the question. And then so that they can really focus on those kind of judgment based value added activities to make the final decision, because, you know, we're unlikely to give that all away uh, to the to the machine. So I think it, it really comes back to what I said before around those data points and really understanding how that works and how that's interoperable between different technologies. Superb. Thanks, James. Uh, well done for tackling that one so succinctly and quickly. Um, we're almost up against time. Michael, Rachel, you've escaped very lightly there, uh, given our time constraints. So I think I'll, I'll just very quickly wrap up just by thanking everyone for attending. Thanks to Innovate Finance and its members. Quick appeal, please do complete the survey, scan the QR code. As I said, we want to do more of these, but we need your feedback before we can do that. So thanks to everyone. Uh, Rachel, do you want to, I'll come to you for any, any closing remarks from yourself. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Just reiterate a big thank you to you, the other speakers. It was a fascinating discussion today and I think really broke down the barriers. But what I really focus on are the opportunities that are there. So it was great to see that brought to life by Vaughan and his use cases. So it was super. Um, like I say, please do complete the evaluation form. We really want to do more of these in future. We will be circulating the recording and the slide pack uh, to attendees afterwards. So thank you very much all. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Excellent. Have a great afternoon. Cheerio.